and welcome to Expert Coffee Chats. I am your host, Laura Moriarty, and if you've got questions, we've got answers. So take a break and have a chat with our Biorad application scientists on your favorite life science topics. Joining me today, I have Kelly, and Kelly is based in the Mid-Atlantic, and she did a postdoc at the US Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, and she has over 12 years experience in chromatography. Good morning and welcome, Kelly. Good morning, Laura. Thank you for having me today. And we also have Brad. Brad's joining us from South Central US, uh, based down there in Texas. And he did his postdoc at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And he has over 13 years experience in chromatography. Welcome, Brad. Yeah, welcome, thanks. And additionally, we have Chelsea. Chelsea's joining us from California. I'm also based in California. Morning, Chelsea. Good morning, Laura. And Chelsea is currently a market development manager for the biopharma folks um, in Biorad. And additionally, she was an applications uh, scientist uh, covering chromatography globally. And she has over 10 years experience with chromatography. So welcome, everybody. Thanks, Laura. Good morning. All right, so to kick us off here, I have a couple of housekeeping items. So we love to get your questions. So please enter those into the Q&A section and we'll bring those up to our panelists. And if you're watching on demand, please also use the Q&A box to enter your questions and we can address those individually by email. And please don't worry if we don't get to your question today, we only have a limited time with our panelists but we will make sure to reach out to you by email as well to address anything that comes up that we don't get to in the webinar this morning. Okay, so with that, I think if our panelists are ready, everybody hang on to your seats. <laughs> Let's kick it <laughs> off with a first question. All right, so this first question actually, it's a, it's a nice warm up question and this is, um, it's actually from me. And uh, believe it or not, I used to work in the lab as well. Uh, I did chromatography for, oh, I don't know, around eight, nine years as part of my um, undergrad work. So the first question for you all is it's a pretty poignant one, is how is chromatography utilized in the development of vaccines? So I'll kick us off here. Um, uh, so vaccines, as we all know, are ways to help stimulate an immune response to a pathogen. And chromatography is heavily used in the development of vaccine and manufacturing. Um, in fact, it's used um, really to make sure that only what the manufacturers want in the vaccine are, is actually there. And typically it's done later on in the vaccine process. You know, they, they will, the companies will have multiple different vaccine candidates that they're looking out. Looking, looking at and optimizing. And then later on in the process, they'll actually do process development to make sure that the vaccine has the correct components and is purified to 100% homogeneity if only what they want. Um, this is actually different. So I'm gonna kind of take a little twist here and talk about how they are developing the vaccine for the coronavirus. They are actually already starting the process development and the optimization of the chromatography process right now for multiple vaccine candidates, meaning that instead of it taking five to 10 years to, to develop a vaccine, they're trying to really hit that 18 month mark to two years. And the way that they're doing that is actually taking the vaccine candidates that might have to be revised and starting the manufacturing process now, meaning that they're using multiple different steps of chromatography, typically a capture step, um, an intermediate step, and then a final polish step. And there's lots of different resins that you can use in this process. We actually have some resins that are used from, from Biorad that are used to make the flu vaccine, um, as well as uh, we have a product called CHT, which is a mixed mode resin that is used in the manufacturing of the HPV vaccine. So there's lots of different ways of purifying and manufacturing vaccines, but chromatography is always a very important step. Um, yeah. And so that's it's very important and it's making sure that the vaccine is is safe and only has what is supposed to be in there. Great. Anybody want to add? So I just, 
Yeah, hi, Laura. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add in there that um, Chelsea mentioned our CHT resin, which is commonly used with vaccine um, purifications, but as well as that, we also use a lot of um, ion exchange as that first capture step. So we're seeing a lot of ion exchange, a lot of mixed mode, and some size exclusion, mainly in vaccine development work. Yeah, that's a really good point, Kelly, in the fact that um, for vaccine development, it's usually, you know, a, a lot of times we, there's only one target of interest and you can add an affinity tag onto the NRC terminus of it and you can, you know, very quickly purify or optimize a purification. But for these vaccine candidates, you really don't want to have a, a tag on there that can be immunogenic. And so you really have to use only the native properties of the protein and ion exchange is a very commonly used capture and intermediate step to really purify the, the protein of interest due to its own biophysical properties. All right, that's a great way to get everyone warmed up <laughs> and uh, ready to uh, give some great insights. So I, I have another question actually, um, selfishly. <laughs> How are researchers <laughs> using um, chromatography right now to, to study these viruses like SARS and MERS and, and, and COVID-2? I think I, I'll start that one off. I'll take the brunt off of Chelsea. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think uh, right now what people are looking at is um, obviously coronavirus is a is a really hot issue right now. So um, from what I've seen, people are using chromatography not only to purify the individual components from the coronavirus, like the spike protein, um, but also things like the ACE2 receptor, or at least the extracellular domain of the ACE2 receptor, the one that actually interacts with the coronavirus. Um, and I've also saw, seen papers where they're, where they're doing a lot of structural biology to like show that interaction along with interactions with different antibody uh, complexes. So they're actually showing structurally how these, how these forms are taking place. And then um, something that researchers always, I always love doing is to, uh, to actually um, biophysically characterize that interaction, right? So you wanna, you don't, it's not enough that the antibody binds, it needs to bind tightly. And so in order to do those assays, you really need pure protein. Um, and then that goes a long way in, uh, in developing like rational therapeutics. Right, so um, which I think is really important in the long term for any kind of therapy. But uh, since since we have the components right now, I think that's what a lot of researchers are are kind of trying to do is gather all of the components up so that they can do those biophysical assays. Mm -hmm. I had just a quick thing to add to what Brad's saying. Um, you know, we're talking about MERS and SARS. You know, these viruses have been around for you know twenty years and. We're really lucky that you know researchers have done the work and done the biophysical yeah. analysis on these proteins over the past 20 years because it's really giving a lot of information to the companies to develop the, these vaccine candidates. And it's interesting to see you know the work that they've done over the past 20 years really being used to um, like uh, there's certain mutations within the binding domain of the uh, spike protein that are used to stabilize the conformation to like help antibodies bind and to, to generate an immune response. And so I really want to give a shout out to those researchers that have continued to work on these viruses, you know, after both MERS and SARS kind of died down because their work is now being, you know, essential for the development of, of vaccines and, and antiviral therapeutics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great points. Okay, here's uh, one from the audience. This is, oh, this is a great one. <laughs> what are some of your suggestions to help me increase yield and purity? You know, that's, it's, it's you know, just a small question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start off on this one, sorry. Um, so I think a lot of this goes into method development, really, when you're first starting out with your protein. You need to know your protein, know its inherent properties, know its PI, know its molecular weight, its hydrophobicity. And what you want to be able to do then is exploit those differences between your target protein and any possible contaminants that may come along with the purification. 
So what I usually suggest is starting with a high capacity column. Now, starting with a high capacity column, it would certainly behoove you to screen several other columns as well and see which column gives you the best selectivity and capacity for your um, sample prep. As well as screening several different columns, you need to take buffers into consideration. You want to make sure that you're in a buffer that has your protein being in its most stable form for its purification. And you also wanna make sure that you're using a buffer system that's not going to interfere with the binding or interaction of your sample target protein with the resin and column chemistry. As well as buffers, you can play around with gradients. If you're not getting the resolution that you may want and you're running a step gradient, try a linear gradient. If you're already using a linear gradient, try shallowing out that slope to get better separation between your target protein and any of its little friends that it's bringing along with them during the purification. <laughs> you may also consider slowing down your sample time loading. So that will extend the amount of time that your sample is able, able to interact with the column as it's moving through. Those would be my, my general broad type suggestions to start off with. Do you guys have anything that so, you would add? I think um, I would just add one other thing, and that is um, the importance of the resins in the process, right? So like, I know BioRed offers several different kinds of say ion exchange resin from like high pressure to low pressure, but also in between there, there are different resins and they have uh, different chem chemistries and mm -hmm. sometimes when you're doing a purification and you get some of those uh, impurities, the impurities aren't because of the actual functional group. The impurities are a result of you, some proteins binding non-specifically to the, the resin itself. So it would be a good investment to just, you know, try out different types of resin along the way to see if, you know, a different type of resin would help get, get you where you want to go. I have one more thing to add. Um, sometimes you're having, a, you can have low yield of your protein because it doesn't have everything that it needs to actually be, uh, to purify and to be stable. So like it might uh, need a cofactor. So like zinc finger nucleases, it's, you might chelate out all of the zinc. Um, I also had a, a researcher in my lab for my PhD that had a protein that wasn't stable as a homodimer. It actually had a partner that it was a heterodimer with. And if you tried to purify it by itself, it just, it had very, very mm -hmm. yield. And until she actually purified it with its um, uh, analogous partner, which she didn't know at the time it actually made a heterodimer, that's what actually allowed her to increase her yield and purity. So sometimes it's kind of reading up on literature and finding out if it needs a cofactor, if it needs another uh, partner or subunit, um, protein subunit to actually go along with it to help stabilize the protein and increase the yield. Um, another thing is finding the optimal temperature to actually do induction of the protein expression. Sometimes you might need to go a little bit lower, um, maybe adding in some glucose as well, not glucose, uh, glycerol as well to just like slow down the process of the, the bacteria making the protein and having the chaperones there to help put it into the appropriate form. So making, helping making it actually produce the protein. Um, yeah. Uh, brilliant. Wow. That was, that was pretty good. I mean, that, that question could have been answered for, you know, a couple of hours over uh, maybe more than a coffee, but um, you did a great job, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's another one. Um, oh, so how are lysates usually prepared before they're applied to the column? Filtration, centrifugation, and additionally, how does the scale affect this procedure? So here, here it comes. So I think I can start out um, and then I might hand it off. But uh, typically, I advise people that the, the column is um, the most expensive filter you'll ever buy, right? And so <laughs> um, you want to make sure that either through filtration or centrifugation, um, you, you get rid of any aggregates before applying it to the column. Um, I know I've been in labs that will centrifuge and filter, and I've been in labs that do one or the other, but either way, you want to be sure to get rid of any aggregates. Um, 
and that that also means um, you know uh, taking into account whether or not it's a biopolymer, right? So if it's a biopolymer, you want to make sure that there's nothing in your buffer that will cause it to polymerize. Um, and then uh, also finding a good way to uh, get rid of genomic DNA. Um, typically, people will use sonication. Um, so if you if you're working with your your protein prep and it kind of looks a little snotty, um, that's usually a, a big a big sign that that you have have a lot of genomic DNA there that that you need to somehow get rid of either by enzymatic means or by actual mechanical means. Um, and then uh, scale. I mean, I've I've done for me lab scale means anywhere between say like five or 10 mils all the way up to like of expression, just to kind of test it out all the way up to 12 liters um, or maybe 20 liters I once did. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, uh, regardless of the scale, it's always important that you, you find ways to clarify. So if it was a 20 liter prep, I was at the centrifuge all day long. Um, and if it was five mils, I probably just used a, a, a small centrifuge and then and then filtered it, um, and then I, I think that's that's all the that I can think of right now. Do, does anybody else want to add anything? Go ahead, Kelly. So what the only thing I would add is that this is kind of a bonus tip, right? Like uh, Brad just mentioned that the column is your most expensive piece of filter that you'll ever see, so you want to take care of it. So if you are I always suggest doing centrifugation as well as filtration. You wanna make sure that you're using filters that do not bind protein. Cellulose and nylon filters do tend to bind up some of your protein, so you might take a hit on, the, on uh, yield with those. As well as that, the more clarified your sample is, is the less junk or contaminants you're gonna leave behind on your column. And in that case, the less junk, the less times it needs to go through a stringent, aggressive cleaning. The less times it goes through that, it extends the longevity of your column. So you're really taking care of your protein in that purification as well as taking care of your column in the long run. Yeah, I just wanna add a, a quick thing. So I started out using sonication um, with my first protein of interest and the actual heat that was generated um, during sonication was just not good for the protein that, that I had. So I actually ended up switching over and using a French press. And that ended up being um, a lot easier, a lot more straightforward. It didn't have that, uh, it would break up that snot texture that, that Brad mentioned um, and really, really helped me. And then I would do, you know, a high speed centrifugation. And then instead of just taking and pouring from my uh, tube into, you know, another tube to separate out the supernatant from the pellet, I would actually take a pipette and suck up the, the, the clear part so that you don't get the light particles being transferred into your supernatant that can cause uh, column clogging as well. So there's a few tips there in terms of just um, you know, doing the high speed centrifugation and then also how you transfer it and separate out the supernatant from the pellet can actually, if you're just pouring it in, you can pour some of those particulates back into your supernatant and cause column clogging. Um, and then as you increase in scale, what we see once you kind of move from the lab scale to the process scale is that you have optimization of the proteins being excreted into the supernatant instead of being inside the lysate. So that's that's one way of like transitioning from having to do the lysate portion to being actually being released into the supernatant and then using tens tangential flow filtration or TFF to separate out the cells from the protein so that you actually don't have that centrifugation step because that's not really a scalable procedure. So if you're kind of in the lab scale where you're, you know, smaller scale, not planning on manufacturing, you're probably going to be sticking with, you know, lysing the cells and not moving through that process of getting it to actually um, be excreted from the cells. But if you're looking to actually scale up and have a process manufacturing, you're going to want to look into actually having, you know, N or C terminal, um, not tags, but um, peptides that have it actually excreted out into the supernatant so that you can take and, and purify it um, using TFF, which is a scalable process. Super. Great. All right. So I'm going to keep us going. I have another question here from the audience. Here we go. 
So what types of resins do you think undergraduate students should learn about or use in teaching labs to get them ready for biomedical research? Hmm. Or what are the most commonly used resins in biomedical research? Hmm. Good question. I, I'll, I'm going to jump in and take this one. Um, I think that it's great to have um, several different types, I would say categories. So capture type, so affinity type resin. So like a nickel resin and then intermediate purification uh, resins, which are typically ion exchange or mixed mode. And then your final resins are gonna be your SEC or mixed mode or um, uh, HIC resins. So in terms of the types, it's I, I'm not going to be brand specific. I think that undergraduates should learn about all of the different chemistries that are you know used in manufacturing yeah. today, um, and all of the different properties that are important. And I know that ion exchanges, you know, we think of just the normal anion or cation exchange, but also having them learn about what the base bead is made of, and realizing that the protein isn't just interacting with that functional group that it's interacting with the entire resin and re realizing that the, the protein's properties and the base bead properties are going to be interacting and having an effect. And so if you have a slightly hydrophobic protein and you're using a hydrophilic base bead, that you're not gonna get as good of a process as you are with a slightly hydrophobic base bead along with that hydrophobic protein so that you can actually have more interactions that are specific to that protein and get rid of the other proteins that are binding to just the ligand itself. And then so, for what are the most, I'll let you go, no. Brad, and then I'll jump back in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think I, I, I agree with everything that you said, like just understanding the chemistries is super mm -hmm. important. Um, I think the, the one thing that I never uh, used in grad school or as a postdoc, what I see used a lot in um, like biopharma is mixed mode resins. Um, and it's, uh, I think I think that might be because mixed mode resins um, require a, a greater level of optimization um, to use efficiently. But uh, the reason that they're used in biopharma is because it's a very, very efficient type of resin. So you can you can kind of take advantage of multiple aspects of the protein on a single load. Um, mm -hmm. So if if possible, if I could go back and learn something over again, that would make me ready to just like pop into a, a, a biopharma lab, I, I would have more experience with like CHT resin, especially, right? Um, so if I can plug one of our, our specific products, but I think, <laughs> but we see, we see a lot of CHT being used. Um, and, and I think that that's, and when I see it being used, it's, uh, it seems that it's a very, it's a much more efficient process um, for purification. Yeah, Sorry, Chelsea, it gives continue. No, 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 no. It's, that's great um, because it, it's, it, you're absolutely correct. It's, it gives multiple ways of the protein interacting with um, the column or the resin and for, for mixed mode. And again, most of the time in biomedical research, they're not using affinity tags. They're trying to purify the protein as is in, in its you know native state. And mixed mode gives multiple ways of being able to purify that protein. Perfect. Thank so, you. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, ahead. Kelly. I was just going to suggest from a from looking at it from an undergraduate student perspective, I would say the flow of learning chromatography, you may want to start with affinity because it's the easiest one to kind of wrap your brain around and then maybe move mm -hmm. to ion exchange and then ultimately lead to mixed mode because I think that's the most challenging for under an undergrad student oh. level to understand. Yeah. yeah, great. Great advice. Thank you to the panel. Here we go. Here's a a little bit more of a succinct question. Not sure about the answer though. <clears throat> Have you any tips for peptide purification rather than protein purification? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't have to start every question. So if anybody else wants to go, that's fine. Go ahead, Kelly. 
I'll just say briefly with peptide purification. So I worked with an extremely hydrophobic peptide in my graduate studies, and I had to use reverse phase HPLC. It's the only thing that I could get it purified with. So depending on the hydrophobicity of it, and if it, you think it would interact with a C14 or C18 type um, column, then that's where that's the route I would go. Yeah, I I would just add because um, I did a lot of peptide work also, um, and. Uh, the two things that I found is um, have a have it tagged to something like a solubility tag, um, because a, a lot of times those tiny little peptides might get chewed up or um, they might cause aggregation or whatever. So having a solubility tag around will typically uh, do you good. Um, and then also, if you can, uh, integrate uh, denaturing prep in there. So you can run uh, nickel columns with urea and typically um, unfolded proteins uh, in six to eight molar urea don't like to bind non-specifically to anything else. So you can kind of increase your, your purity in a single step. And since it's a peptide, it really doesn't care whether or not it's folded. Ho hopefully you should probably <laughs> verify that yourself. Um, but yeah, and then, uh, sorry, uh, multi-wave detectors. So in chromatography, um, unless you're lucky and the peptide has a tryptophan or some other aromatic residue, um, a lot of times mine didn't, being able to assay it at 215, 215 nanometers uh, to detect the peptide backbone really helped in, in purification. And, and I'll just add one more thing is that, you know, whenever you're purifying smaller proteins or peptides, you're gonna wanna reduce the bead size um, and pore size on that bead. So using more analytical columns than preparative columns are, are probably gonna be your best bet because it will keep larger proteins from being able to actually bind to, um, to the ligand or the, that's on the resin. Great, all right, let's keep this going. Uh, another one from the audience here. Is expanded bed chromatography still being used in industry? Are you seeing that with your customers that you're interacting with? I am really not. Um, uh, that's something that I, I think that they were, were trying to use, but that it just didn't have the success that they had hoped that, that it would have. Um, that's not... Um, people are moving more in industry to continuous chromatography rather than the expanded bed. Um, but uh, yeah, that was something that was tried out. But And it's great for um, uh, virus purifications because it allows, you know, there's channels within within the chromatography, but it, it doesn't actually, um, uh, it, it, it didn't play as well in, as in, in industry as, as we had hoped. Kelly, Brad? I I've never run into see... expanded bed. Okay. Okay. Agreed. Yeah. So not that popular then. <laughs> Sorry. I think that one spoke for itself there. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's another one. Let's try and lighten the mood a little. All right. Uh, you all mentioned a lot about resin chromatography. Do you offer any porous membrane for chromatography? Hmm. Do it, Chelsea. We don't. <laughs> um, as of right now, at this very specific time, no, we don't have any porous membrane for chromatography. Membranes are a good way, um, especially for virus purifications, because they can be used um, very selectively for the different types of viruses. Um, you know, Biorad is really more uh, at this point resin uh, com uh, company, but you know that that is a good a good question, and it is a. Um, Valid question, definitely for for um, purification. So there definitely are more and more looks at at membrane chromatography as well. Great. Yeah. All right. Oh, here's another. Oh man, <laughs> another easy one for you all. I'm having problems with protein precipitation. Uh, what are your recommendations for aiding in solubility? Ooh. Um, <laughs> so I'll start this <laughs> out. Sorry. 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 I'm I'm always so excited. <laughs> um, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, solubility tags, um, in my experience, 
that has been night and day a change. Um, a lot of people, when they first start, they will put their protein of interest in a vector that basically expresses a 6x his tag, and that does nothing for solubility. So, and they they sell. There are a lot of vectors out there that have solubility tags. Um, like uh, MBP and GST are, are just two that I used, um, but I'm sure that you could come up with a couple. Um, a lot of times also they make these so that the, sol the tag can be cleaved later by a protease. So um, look into that beforehand. Um, the other thing that I think Chelsea brought this up earlier is like binding cofactors. Right. So like if you need to, you might have to co-express it with some other binding cofactor to make sure that like it just needs that for stability stability um, along the same lines. Um, make sure that you any other cofactors that it typically has in cells you supply. So um, if it's a zinc finger protein, don't use EDTA to chelate out all the divalent metals because the zinc will chelate out and it's probably not good for the protein. Um, and then I guess uh, uh, high osmolites. So um, something like 20% sucrose. Um, I typically see this more often in the beginning stages of chromatography, um, where in lysis, it will, uh, people will start out with, um, say, 20% sucrose in there to help keep things all folded. Because um, proteins, unlike uh, the United States population right now, um, proteins don't like to be socially isolated. They like kind of being <laughs> grouped together and like pushed on, right? And, with their friends. And so, exactly. They, they love being in there with their friends, right? So when you plop mm -hmm. a protein down in itself in water, um, it typically reacts negatively to that. So having some high osmolites in there will definitely help. Um, well, not definitely help, but that's what I would try. Um, I guess, is there anything else you guys can think of? Oh, good, good. Kelly, Kelly. <laughs> so don't forget about pH. Make sure your pH is um, right. above or below the, the protein's pi so it doesn't crash out of solution. So pH is important. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah, that was Perfect. what I was going to say as well. Make sure your pH does not <laughs> equal your pi. Proteins That's like to be right. charged. One way or the That's other. Right. That's right. So charged and not isolated. I think that's good advice. <laughs> In the lab and out of the lab, right? Okay, uh, here's another one from the audience. Have you any experience with twin column or tandem chromatography? Mm. Who wants this one? Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to start mean, every I single one. I think all of us do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I was going to give Chelsea a chance because I don't think she's <laughs> got to start off in a while. <laughs> Go for um, it, Chelsea. Yeah, I can do it. So, uh, yes, we have quite a bit of um, experience with uh, twin column or tandem chromatography. Um, tandem chromatography typically means that you have one column in line as you're loading and then whatever your elution solution is, it can immediately go on to your second column. We typically see this in protein A to desalting columns, but it also can be used for um, ion exchange to desalting or an ion exchange to another ion exchange, depending on um, if you're using the pH to actually change the, um, the charge of the protein so that it's captured on one column and then uh, subsequently cap captured on the second column. Um, for any type of twin column chromatography, what I would highly recommend is to have um, two different valves on your, on your system so that you can monitor the pressure independently on each column and to also make sure that your um, columns are compatible in terms of both their, their puffering conditions as well as their pressure conditions because you don't want to have a high pressure column after a low pressure column so that it, the pressure from the second column is going to be impacting the first column. So there's more um, optimization required to use a tandem or, or twin column chromatography, but it, in the end it actually results in a lot quicker chromatography and, and speeds up the purification process. Um, 
if you kind of know your columns and, and know that they, they work well, well together, I would highly recommend moving to this type of chromatography just because it minimizes the hands-on time. The, the more, the less hands-on time you have, the, the more consistent your purifications are going to be. The, right. Go ahead. Sorry. I, um, I would just add in terms of if somebody, I've had people approach me about setting up, uh, like kind of tandem column purification. And the one thing that I always uh, breathe a sigh of relief about is typically um, if, if the first column is a elutes with a step gradient, right? So like mm -hmm. if you go from some washing percent B up to a hundred and you know where the protein is gonna elute, that makes the entire process way easier. Um, and then uh, this might not be part of the question, but I did see, I think we published a paper, a tech guide on um, tandem column purification. Well, we have actually done a lot of publications on this, but one of them where we, we use two size exclusion columns basically to increase um, resolution. So like tandem of the same column in a, like a non-absorbing technique can also increase your resolution as well. Great. Perfect. Thank you. All right. all right. So here's a, oh, wow. This is another easy one for you all. <laughs> I'm picking the easy ones. Sure. All right. I'm working on a new protein target. Where do I start? <laughs> oh, this is getting flashbacks to my PhD here. Any columns or resins you would recommend? <laughs> um, Who wants to go first? So I will. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, Go for it. So anytime you d start with a new protein, you really need to do lit researches um, to really understand your protein of interest and what's already been done. Um, it's better to learn from other people's mistakes, that, or it's faster to learn from other people's mistakes than to make your own. And I'm one that has learned that uh, mistake multiple times, so now I do a lot more lit searches before I get started in the lab. Um, so understanding both uh, your protein, it's um, biophysical characteristics. And the, there's lots of different online tools now, but the one that I always use was Xfasi. It's an online tool where you can put in your uh, protein sequence and it'll give you the molecular weight, the uh, theoretical PI, as well as hydrophobicity. Um, and then if you're going to you know, start in terms of columns or resins, um, the, the quickest and the easiest way to get started is always gonna be some type of affinity tag. Um, and that could be like Brad mentioned earlier, uh, his tag uh, or a GST tag. Um, I always worked with his tags, but I always would recommend to make sure that there is a way to cleave off that tag at the end of the purification or even perhaps during the purification, because that's going to have an effect on or can have an effect on your protein's kinetic uh, functionality, as well as um, its formation of dimers or trimers, or you know if it does a complex. Um, having that affinity tag on there can inhibit that formation and therefore, you know, keep you from being able to get crystals or for my sake sake, it actually helped me from being able to get kinetic results because the protein performed so poorly. Um, and then columns and resins that I would recommend, uh, it, it depends on kind of what the PI of your protein is, but I would make sure and look into what the base bead of the resin is as well as the pore size. If you have a smaller protein, you're gonna wanna go with a smaller pore size so that you aren't binding larger proteins that could contaminate it and elute off with it. If you have a larger protein, you're gonna wanna go with a larger pore size because large proteins can't bind into small pores. Um, so we have a new iron exchange resin, uh, it's uh, called Nuvia HPQ that has a much larger pore size to allow for, say, um, native protein complexes to be able to be purified. Um, so large complexes, uh, viruses as well, large viruses, to be able to pur be purified because the pore size is larger and it allows for it to actually bind more readily to the, to the, the ligand and the resin surface. Go ahead, Brad. Can I just Brad? add something here? Yeah, yeah. So um, typically, if you're starting out, um, I always thought of, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to do, but um, where where you wanna be like in protein purification, there's a Venn diagram that is like speed, yield and purity, right? And typically you get to pick two. Um, so, and when you're starting out, you're lucky to get one. Um, but you, uh, you know, if you, 
if you're gonna look into um, like optimizing as you go, those are the three things that I would track, right? So you wanna be sure and actually, you know, track how is my, how long is it taking me to do all of this stuff? What is my yield and what is my purity? And then that, that then that spreadsheet that you keep will then direct you on what you need to optimize in order to get to that center part of that Venn diagram saying like, you know, this is the perfect purification, right? Cause once you're in the center, you can't, you can't get any better. Leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great advice. Really, really good advice. I wish we were around when I was <laughs> starting in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, oh, here's another one. Here's another great one. What maintenance should I be performing on my instrument? Should I be performing maintenance on my instrument? Yes. <laughs> oh, Kelly. I'll take this one. Every time you're using the instrument, you should always be cognizant of looking the instrument over, making sure you're not having any leaks anywhere. That's first and foremost. At the end of the day, when you're completed your run, you want to make sure that you're removing any buffers. You want to remove these buffers from your column as well as um, your entire system line, as well as the fraction collector line. So you just want to flush some water through for a little bit, make sure all that buffer is removed from the system. And then we want to go into 20% ethanol for overnight storage so that nothing grows overnight. You do the water first, so you're removing any chances of precipitation, and then you do your ethanol. You come in the next morning, you know it's an ethanol, you wanna start with water. Before you go to buffer, you, you wanna make sure anytime you're using ethanol, it's bookend with water. Um, if you're going to be using your pH meter during the day, you wanna make sure you calibrate that if you want to know the exact pH of it. Weekly, if you have an NGC system, you wanna make sure you're changing your pump head wash solution um, with 20% ethanol fresh each week. And if you are in a cold room with an NGC, we do recommend get, having a hard reboot um, about once a week just to avoid any connection issues. Yearly, the pumps should be looked over and um, any seals should be replaced and any check valve should be replaced as well as tubing should be replaced about on once a year basis or so and any filters that you have in inline filters or buffer solvent um, filters. And most columns, we usually suggest us cleaning the column out of buffer, putting it in water, and storing it in 20% ethanol. Right. Do you guys have anything and usually, to add? So um, as far as column cleaning goes, um, a lot of times the, the number one thing I always say is clean it in reverse, right? Um, unless the manufacturer specifically says not to, just because you don't want to solubilize all the funk on the top frit and put it down <laughs> through your resin. Right. Um, you want to solubilize it and then send it out. Um, and and so uh, as far as cleaning columns, um, there's I should also point out that there's no one way. So you really want to look up from the column manufacturer and it usually says like CIP or clean in place. Um, and that'll give you guidelines on what uh, chemical and composition and uh, not composition, chemical uh, concentration you want to use. Great. All right. Chelsea. Yeah, I just want to add one more thing. So if you're loading a large volume of sample and you're using a sample pump, you want to make sure and clean that sample pump out immediately after the run wow. with sodium hydroxide. Really kind of clean that, that pump out to make sure that you don't have muck growing in there overnight. I mean, yeah, rinsing it with water and ethanol is good and you want to make sure and store the entire system with in ethanol, but sodium hydroxide through the sample pump to make sure that you've kind of really cleaned the system out is, is essential to, to the longevity of, of the pump. The way you are answering these questions also, makes me feel like um, everyone's kind of been through some of these issues. <laughs> no, maybe once or twice. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, you had one more tip. That's okay. All I was going to say is also make sure that you do, when you're cleaning with water and an ethanol, make sure that you're sending some fractions of your fraction collector so that we're cleaning that drop head as well. Right. Ooh, Good point, Kelly. Yeah. 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 All righty. So we're coming up on our allotted time. So I'm going to pick this one. I think this is a good one to end on. 
um, probably affecting many of uh, the folks uh, listening in. So I left the lab in a hurry to shower in place. Yep. Um, what do you recommend I do before um, I start my system up again? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll start this out and then you guys can kind of take it away. Um, so the, the first thing that I would do is a good visual inspection, not just glancing over and making sure it's still there, but actually look at it and look in all the buffers and everything <laughs> and see if anything's growing. Okay. Um, if you have growth, uh, your day is going to get long. Um, but we do. So I know we have a uh, sanitization protocols. Um, I think there's a resources uh, along with this um, this this webinar, uh, and we put in the sanitization protocol in there too. So um, so we have bulletins on how to sanitize your your system. Um, you probably will want to do that anyway, but especially be mindful of it if, if you actually see growth. Um, the other thing that I would do, no matter what, even if the buffers are like look clear, um, I would make all new buffers, all new buffers, new water, new 20% ethanol, new everything, okay? It's a brand new year. You're getting back to work. <laughs> Just start the year, start it off right. Um, and then I would start running the system uh, and checking for any kind of blockage. Okay, put make sure you don't have any columns in line, but um, start running the system and check all the inlets and all the outlets. Run it to the bio, like the biofrac or whatever fraction collector you have. Um, make sure that there's no blockages. Um, if there are, you either need to free the blockage. Um, sometimes you can take the tubing off and syringe through some hot water. Um, and the hot water will usually help dissolve any salts that are in line, or you just have to replace that piece of tubing entirely. Um, once you determine that the system is ready to go, then I would start looking at the columns. And like we kind of addressed with the previous question, um, you know, cleaning in place protocols, I would go ahead and just clean everything out in reverse, um, make sure that everything's good to go before you actually uh, get back to it. Go ahead, Kelly. So the only thing I would add to that is prior to starting your system back up, I would give it a nice, good, hard reboot just to make sure the connections are still good with the computer because I know a lot of the institutions have been probably pushing um, software and security updates. So that's the only thing I would add. Great advice, yeah, everybody. I think that I don't have anything to add. I think, you know, make sure and clean your columns uh, according to their, the manufacturer of the columns um, recommendations. Um, but yeah, definitely start with the system and then move to the columns and, you know, one step at a time to get it back up and running and making it happy again. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Thank you, everyone. Right. So super awesome advice there. And, and yeah, let's, let's, let's call it a wrap. I think that um, everybody did a great job. Congratulations. You should all feel really good. <laughs> I think there were some really nice questions from the audience too. So thank you, everybody, as well. I think you put yeah, our thanks. panel through um, yeah. uh, some, uh, some good brain thinking and some flashbacks <laughs> to uh, bad experiences in the lab by uh, some of the cringing <laughs> looks on their faces as well. So, <laughs> um, so we, uh, we really enjoyed it. And we, we actually are going to be running a, a series of these coffee chats with experts. And on the screen right now, you can see the schedule for the next couple of months where we're going to run through some different topics, including Western blotting, multiplex amino assays, droplet digital PCR, QPCR, real-time PCR, uh, multi-parameter flow cytometry, as well as a focus on mixed mode chromatography and column packing uh, at the process scale. So we hope that you can join us at these future panels and please do share with your colleagues in the lab. I know that not everyone is in the lab at this time, but let's make the most of this, this time that we have in our homes to, you know, to research, plan and prepare for when we are back in the lab. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks again to everyone on the panel. Thanks, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. And take, take care and stay safe. Goodbye.